again and welcome back to another episode of Adding Game Sounds where today we're going to look at taking uh, some music and implementing it basically. Uh, in the last video we took a look at a uh, design for an interactive music track which if you missed you can watch, uh, there'll be a link in the top right corner for you to quickly check out. But we're going to be uh, taking that music and we're going to be looking at the first steps to implementing it, uh, particularly we're going to be implementing it so that it changes um, horizontally and so that as the player progresses through uh, a level, which we'll be looking at in a second, the music will change with them. Don't forget that any of the scripts that you see me use in this video, you can access from scottgamesounds.com. Just come to this website, which I'll have linked in the description of this video. You go to this page, C Sharp Scripts, and you'll not only be able to find a whole list of videos we've done on this channel, but all the scripts used in that video. So you just click on one, copy and paste it, and you're good to go. Not only can you copy scripts, but you can also download uh, the FMOD project that we used in the last video looking at the interactive music we'll be implementing today. You can download the project and you'll have access to this uh, event here that I talked about and designed. So if you want, you can actually follow along with this video so you can implement the music yourself. One thing to note, by the way, if you've been following along from the start of this series, is that I'm now using FMOD 2.0. Now, I recently made a video talking about how you can update the integration package you're using with Unity so that you can use newer versions of FMOD. So I'll have that linked in the top right corner of this video for you to check out. Before we do that, however, uh, I need to quickly address a fixed to one of our previous scripts we made because I found a little bug that needs fixing. If you'll remember, uh, in an old video, we made a script that creates a falling sound. So as the player starts falling through the air, you hear like a whooshy sound, a whoosh, to you know, kind of simulate them part traveling through the air. Well, watch what happens. Let me quickly start this scene. Uh, basically, from the first scene to the second scene, there's a transition uh, that happens whilst the player is in the air. So you hear that whooshy sound. But if I quickly make my way to the area where you transition, listen to what happens. Yeah, not great. It doesn't stop. So let's quickly have a look at how we can fix that. In each scene, we have a copy of our class, which is FMOD Player. Now, at the start of both the first and the second scene, they both create an empty event instance variable called falling, which is this one here. Now we've programmed this class to create a new instance of our event and store it inside this empty variable once the player starts to fall. So if I scroll down to quickly remind you, in the player falling function, once it detects that uh, the player is falling and that there isn't an event playing already inside that variable, we create an instance of the falling event, which is this one here, Ellen falling and we then tell it to start playing, and we also tell it to prepare to release. So basically it waits until it's told uh, to stop playing the event, and then once the event has stopped, the instance is released from the falling variable, freeing it up again and making it empty, which as you can see is this line of code here. So it waits for when the player then touches the ground again for it to tell the event to stop playing. Well, if the player transitions into a new scene before they touch the ground, the event is never told to stop. Now you might be thinking, hold on, but the class is in our second scene, so surely it should recognize that the player is touching the ground once they eventually land in the second scene, and then tell the event to stop. Well actually, no, that's not quite how it works, because don't forget, inside the second scene, there's a whole new copy of this class, and therefore a new copy of this variable. So the copy of fmod player that's in the second scene only has control over the copy of the falling variable that it's created, but it doesn't have control over the original one created in the first scene that's still playing the sound effect. As we made that transition into the new scene, this copy, the original copy of the fmod player class and its variable were destroyed essentially, but obviously the instance itself was never stopped and therefore released, so that's why we still hear it. And that's also why we no longer have control over it, because we're now at, we now have access to a new variable and not the original one. So to fix this, we're going to make our variable static, and the way we do that is by writing the keyword static 
in front of its data type, which in our case is this bit here, fmod studio event instance. Static variables remain consistent across all instances of themselves. No matter how many copies of our class and by extension, our falling variable we create, the variables will all have control over a shared value or piece of data, or in our case, a shared instance of our falling event in fmod. So now when the player enters the second scene, the falling variable within this copy of the fmod player class can tell that very same event instance that was created in the first scene to stop playing, because remember it's static, so it has access to the same data that was within the first copy of this variable. Static variables also make it easier to access our event instance or any other form of data that we're storing in them from different classes. As to demonstrate what I mean by this, I'm gonna go back to the water area script, which if you'll remember from when we last edited it, I'll, again, I'll link it in the top right corner. We were using this to basically uh, tell the falling sound to stop when the player entered the water and was killed. Now normally we'd have to direct our other class, which in this case is the water area class, to the exact component that is using a copy of our fmod player class, to then direct it to the variable we want access to. So in the case of the water area class, as you can see here we created a reference variable of the fmod player type, and we set it to check for the object that collided with the water, and get the component of the fmod player data type to store within this variable. So obviously that object is the player. Once the player hits water, it then looks through all the components attached to the player, finds the one of the type fmod player, and stores a reference of it in that variable. From there, we can then access the variable we're after, which is the falling variable. Now the reason why we do it this way is because the water area class needs to know which specific copy of our fmod player class it needs to target and pull its copy of this variable from, in case we've used this class multiple times in our scene, because again, that means we're using and creating multiple copies of this variable. But even if we did have multiple copies of the fmod player, we've now made our variable static. And because it's static, we know that all copies of it will point to the same piece of data, or again in our case, the same instance of our falling event. So because the piece of data is going to be the same amongst all copies of this variable, we don't need to point the water area class to a specific instance of it, which means we can remove lines such as this, and instead of telling our script to find the falling through the reference variable which stored a copy of our fmod player class, we can simply just point it to the class itself just like that. So I'm going to quickly change everywhere that says FP to uh, fmod player, and it should still work the same, both in the on trigger enter uh, function, and I think we also put that in the, yes, here we go, inside the on trigger exit function. Now notice that the player submerged uh, variable is also trying to, we're also trying to find that variable through a copy of the fmod player uh, script or class rather. Now we know that we can make variables within the fmod player class static because we know we're only ever going to need one piece of data for each of them. The reason why is because there's only ever one player in our game. So for example with our falling variable, because there's only ever one player, there's only ever going to be one copy of our event playing the falling sound. This also means for variables such as player submerged, which you'll remember is just a variable checking to see whether or not the player is in water or not. Again, there's only ever gonna be one player, so we only ever need one piece of data for this variable. We don't, we don't need multiple. So we can also make this static as well, which in turn is going to make it easier for us to access through other classes. So again, for player submerged, I'm going to just reference the class that it was declared in directly and do the same thing on the on trigger uh, enter function. And now we can make sure to save both the water area script and the fmod player script. One other quick change I've made is that I've changed the value of the seek speed for when our velocity parameter descends. 
Instead of descending uh, between values instantly, it now descends at a rate of 95 per second. And this is so that when we transition between those scenes, the intensity of this event is kind of smoothed out a little bit. If the value in velocity changes instantly, we're gonna hear it in the sound and it's gonna sound very abrupt. So hopefully this kind of smooths that out a little bit. Okay, so now if we transition from scene one to scene two, there we go. We only we hear the, the the original copy of the variable isn't you know still there, isn't still playing in our new scene. But that's everything we need to talk about the uh, falling event and the little bug that was happening with that. So now let's make our way over to Zone Four, where we can really talk about what we're here, uh, what we're interested in today which is the music. Okay, so just to give you a quick recap on the music that we created, it's designed to basically, it's split up into five sections. And depending on where the player is in the level, one of these sections will be playing. So not only is our goal for this video, or this lesson or whatever you want to call it, to play our music, but we also want to get our cursor on the event to change from the intro to section one, two, three, four, and so on, during the appropriate times. And also, if, if you did watch that video, you'll remember I pointed out some specific areas on this map here, let's make it a bit, bit bigger, uh, where I want the music to change. Now those areas are uh, here, so right at the beginning when the player shoots this little switch, I want it to change from the intro to section one. Uh, the player then makes their way over here. Here's switch number two, so that will transition it into section two. Uh, then the player falls down here, uh, kills a few enemies, completes a little puzzle, pushes this crater down, or this box, down into this gap. That box will then trigger this switch, and then I want this switch to uh, change the music from section, I forgot where we are now, I think section two. Yeah, so we're gonna then transition it into section three. Moving on, the player comes along here, kills some more enemies. Uh, again, another little puzzle involving crates. The crate will then fall down this gap here, triggering this switch. That's gonna transition the music to section four. And then finally, once they've done that, they need to make their way across this little river here, which will now have platforms for them to jump on. And they're going to collect this key here. Once they've done that, the music will then transition back into the intro, uh, which will kind of just fade them out or you know, end the level as they, you know, this elevator, once they collect the key, will send them back to the beginning. Uh, and yeah, the music will just kind of sit there not doing much. So the first thing we need is um, a script, basically. A script to tell our event or our music event to start playing, uh, stop when we leave this level. We only want this music playing for this level. Uh, and also we need uh, an event, oh, sorry, uh, a function rather, um, which we can control our progress parameter through, which if you'll remember, is a parameter that's going to switch us between sections. So what I've done uh, is on the background music player, I've disabled the original uh, script component that uh, was built in Unity, and I've made my own called FMOD Music Level 4. So let's take a look at that. As you can see, it's very simple. Only a few functions, so this shouldn't take too much to explain. First thing you'll notice is an event instant variable called music. And what you might also notice is I've made it static. Ah, I've linked it together with the intro. Uh, okay, so the reason why I made it static is, as we've just talked about, static variables uh, remain consistent amongst all the copies of, or, you know, yeah, all the copies of themselves, essentially. Uh, obviously, we only ever want one copy of our music event to play. We don't want two, so it makes sense that we make it static. If ever we um, need to access this music uh, variable at all, uh, we we can access the same instance of uh, our event basically without creating another one and you know getting an, a little bug like we had at the beginning of this video. Now this script I'm creating is designed specifically for uh, this music here, so I don't plan on using it in other scenes. So we shouldn't really get an error like we did with the falling sound, but it's better. It makes sense uh, to make it static. Like I said, we only ever need one. Uh, copy of it. Uh, so it's just a little safety precaution. But anyway, once we've got our event instance variable, we need to tell it what event we want to store within it. So in the start function, which runs on the first frame, we're going to set the uh, value uh, of the variable to equal our event. We do that by writing fmodunity.runtimemanager.create instance and then feeding it the event path of our event. I'm sure if you've been following these videos, you'll know how to do that by now. Obviously, you can see I've hard coded it coded it rather than creating a public static 
uh, not static, sorry, public string variable, uh, which you know you can access um, fmod events through the Unity Inspector by doing that. But again, because this script is specifically designed for this event, uh, I don't think it was necessary. I don't plan on using this script in any other scenes, so I won't need to change the event. Anyway, once we've now got our event and stored it with inside, in, within music, we can tell it to start as soon as the game starts on the first frame, and we can also call the release function. So it's now waiting for the event to be told to stop, and then once it has stopped, it will release the instance of the event, freeing up this variable. Quickly skipping this function for the time being, we've also got an onDestroy function, which as you can see will tell the music to stop and also tell the music to fade out whenever the game object that this script is attached to, which is the background music player object, is destroyed. And obviously it will be destroyed once we transition into a new scene. So basically when the player leaves this scene, the music will be told to stop and fade out. Lastly, we have a public function called progress. Now within its parameter brackets, we've created a float variable called progress level. So whenever we call this uh, function, we need to basically feed it a float number, a value, a number, uh, which is going to be stored within this variable. Then once this function is triggered and activated, we're going to access the event within our music event instance variable. And I'm going to set a parameter, um, and that parameter is the progress parameter, which like I said, is the one that switches us between uh, each of these sections. We're going to set the value of that parameter to whatever value we um, fed into the progress level variable. So basically, whenever we call this function, which we'll be doing from other scripts, we're going to give it a number. It's e and that number is either going to be, not zero, probably. Oh, it might be zero, I can't quite remember. But zero, one, two, three, four, five each number correlating with uh, each section. Cool, so that's nice and easy, obviously. Uh, but now we need to look at how we're going to call this function and actually change our music. Now, if you'll remember back to the episode uh, where we looked at triggering one shots, um, we basically looked at these switches here. We also looked at how they used Unity events. Uh, so here we go, I've clicked on this switch here now, and here's the script that uses a Unity event. Now, in case you haven't watched that, I'd recommend it, by the way. Again, I'll link it in the top right. Unity events are a really nice and easy way of triggering multiple functions from various different scripts within your scene um, based on something, <laughs> essentially. Uh, in the case of this script here and these switches, these switches wait for uh, a bullet from our player to be fired and enter the trigger area that's created around the switch. Once it has, it will then run everything in this section here. So actually, before, pretend you can't see this, I'm going to quickly remove that. So what we need to do is uh, basically add our function to this list of other functions that's going to be triggered when the bullet hits this switch. So what we're going to do is we're going to press the plus uh, button on the on enter Unity event. We then need to find our game object that is holding that script and therefore the function uh, that we want to trigger. So you'll remember it was background music player, so let's drag that onto that box here. Then we need to select the function, so let's click no function and change that to uh, the script that contains it. And then it was progress, so let's click on that. Uh, and there you go, so now it's asking for a number. The reason why it's asking for a number is because we said that whenever this function is called, uh, a, numbers, a number needs to be given to it so it can store it within progress level. Uh, so the number we want to give it, let's actually have a look. If we go back to the event, starting the um, event or starting the music will be at the uh, intro section. So that'll just play straight away. We don't need, and progress is going to start automatically on zero, by the way. So that will just start here. So we want to transition it from the intro to section one. So obviously the number we want to feed it is one. And again, FMOD does that. If I click on this transition region here, you can see that I've added the condition that when progress is set, uh, to one, it will transition the uh, cursor from this section here, from intro, to uh, the destination section one, which is here, basically. It'll send it to this marker, starting to play the second section. So, going back to Unity, oh, going back to Unity, there we go. Let's change zero to one. Also, whenever you're using um, Unity events and you want to access specific functions, just make sure that the function is public so that it can be accessed like mine is. Now, last time we talked about Unity events, I didn't actually look at setting up a Unity event 
uh, ourselves within a script. And, uh, well, I'm not really going to do it, but I will quickly explain how you can if you are interested. Um, I would only recommend it if you um, need to trigger multiple uh, functions at once. If we go back into Unity, not only are we triggering music, but we're also triggering uh, a sound effect for, you know, for when the switch is activated. The switch itself is also uh, going to change sprites. It's going to trigger a door animation. So it makes sense for them to use a Unity event. But in case you do want to use a Unity event for controlling your music, uh, I'll quickly explain, we won't go through this whole script, but I'll quickly explain the main bits you need. So to create a Unity event, you can see you need to declare it like you would any other variable. So what they've done here is they've created it, they've made it public so they can access it within Unity's expector. Uh, they wrote Unity event, which is the type, the class that you need to call. Obviously, it's an event. That's what we want. And then you give it a name, which is on enter. And because they created, uh, if I go back to Unity, because they created uh, two separate Unity events, one called on enter, one called on exit, they gave it two names. Or they wrote two names, which tells Unity to create two different Unity events. But for you, obviously, you probably only need one. So you'd get rid of that and you'd just use a semicolon like that. Then inside Unity, obviously you fill it up with all the functions you want to trigger. And then when you want to trigger it, you basically, if I scroll down, you write this, you write the name of your Unity event, followed by dot invoke, two brackets and a semicolon. Now they've told theirs to trigger inside a function called execute on enter. That function is going to be triggered on uh, using the on trigger enter 2D function. So to sum up, basically, when the bullet enters this trigger area, which again is uh, the way it works as a trigger area is because the collider is set to its trigger. Once that bullet enters, the on trigger function will trigger, <laughs> no pun intended, which will then activate this function, which will then activate the Unity event to invoke, which will then activate all these functions to trigger, which will then activate <laughs> our uh, function to trigger and the number that we send to it will then activate this parameter here to switch from this section here to this section here. So there's a lot, there's a lot being activated there. Oh, that was a mouthful. Uh, but anyway, hopefully I haven't overcomplicated that. Uh, let's quickly, actually before I show you, uh, I'll also quickly show you again on another switch. So if I click on this switch here at the top, you can see I've done the same thing here. So I've added um, the same function, the FMOD music level four progress function. Instead, now I'm feeding it the number two. So now because we know that the um, uh, the cursor will be on this section here, section one, let me quickly scroll out of the uh, thing. There we go. We know it will be here. So we can use this um, transition region here to say, okay, when progress is changed from one to two, or is just set to two at any point, whilst the cursor is here, you can then send it to destination marker section two, which is here. And then of course, oh, whoops, and then of course all those other switches I mentioned earlier have the same thing. So the next switch I believe is this one here. Let's quickly click on that. Yeah, there you go. So you can see it's being set to three. The next one is this one here, which is set to four. And if I scroll down to the key, which is a collectible, it also has um, a Unity event, which has been activated by um, a trigger area. This time it's not looking for a bullet though, it's looking for the uh, actual player sprite to touch it. And then when it does, it's going to change our function uh, or our parameter in FMOD rather to five, uh, sending it back to the last section. But there we go. That's pretty much it. It's actually quite simple to do. We're just using trigger areas, essentially. We're basically waiting for certain objects to enter certain areas, then telling our music event to change. So it's, that's really easy to do. Like I said, you don't have to use Unity events to achieve that. You can just use the on trigger enter function and it should you know, work just the same. But anyway, let's actually have a listen finally to how the music sounds in our game. Actually, no, we won't. One, uh, <laughs> one other thing I quickly want to mention is that just to uh, fill out the whole kind of background of the music, I created another event, uh, really easy to do. I put it under sound effects, environment, I called it ambience, and it's just using the environmental ambience audio file. And as you can see, I've just looped it, so it's nice and easy. And then to activate it, just to save time, I've used the Studio Event Emitter, which comes with the FMOD integration package. So you don't have to do any coding. You just type in Add Component, FMOD, select the Event Emitter, then choose the event you want to play, which for me was the Environment event. Then tell it to start on Object Start and stop on Object Destroy. So you're going to hear some birds, some wind, maybe even a tiger in the background whilst you hear the music. That's not part of the music. Um, but yeah, let's quickly, now we'll have a listen to how the music sounds.
Okay, so this is the first section. This is the intro section. As you can hear, pretty simple. It's just one chord being looped because, well, as you can see, there's not much going on here. The player's gonna quickly transition, so I didn't need to add too much music, with some random drums uh, to make it a bit different. Now let's see what happens when I shoot this switch. Ooh, we're getting a melody now and some chord changes. Anyway, let's progress and see if we can change the music again. Oh, whoops, that was embarrassing. You remember, if you watch the music video, you remember I set it up so that uh, when we get close to enemies, the music will change. I haven't implemented that with the programming just yet. That will be in the next video, so keep an eye out for that. So you can kind of hear how this is making the level a little bit more interesting as we get the sections of the music change, you know, as the player progresses. I'll tell you what, I must have played this game about a thousand times over this, the past year doing the series and I still die or I still lose health in the silliest of ways. Okay, so this is what's gonna trigger the next section, so let's push this crate down and listen for what happens. Oh, <laughs> let's get out of the way. So you should also notice that these transitions are sounding very, very even, they're happening on the beat. And if you remember back to the video last time, that's how we set it up in Reaper. So even though our script is telling our um, parameter in FMOD to change uh, instantly, or rather it's sending those values for instantly, uh, because we've quantized the transition regions, it's waiting for the cursor to hit certain bars. In fact, I can explain this while I play the game. It's waiting for the uh, cursor to hit certain bars before it makes the transition. So that way, each section stays in time with each other. can make that. Okay, so here we go. Oh, I nearly sent it then. So again, once this box falls down and hits the next switch, we will hear the fourth section. Now again, you'll remember if you watch the video that uh, this section is unique in that the uh, the closer the player gets to their goal, their destination, which in this case is that key I showed earlier, uh, the music will start to ramp up in intensity. However, again, uh, that's gonna come in a future video. So the closer I get, it's just gonna basically loop this chord. So it's a little bit boring at the moment, but we are going to make that more interesting in the future. There we go. So that worked quite well, I thought. It's paced nice and evenly. There's that bit in the middle which is maybe a little bit long, but with each sort of major piece of progression that the player makes, we hear the change in music. So, you know, even though even though each section could be seen as a little bit repetitive, uh, because the sections are being introduced uh, one after the other at sort of intervals you'd expect based on the kind of progression and the pace of this level, everything works out quite nicely as well. And again, as I explained, this is a very simple way of getting your horizontal or just any sort of transition in your music to change is by using trigger areas and then simply calling a function which feeds a value into your FMOD uh, parameter. So with that, I think that's everything for this video. Again, thank you very much for watching. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, like I said in the, uh, last time, I'm going to try and keep these up every Friday. These are going to come out. The next one uh, will be the... Um, we're going to look at... Let's go back to FMOD quickly. We're going to look at the fourth section I mentioned that is uh, has its own way of progress progressing. So you remember in the last video where we talked about the event reference uh, instrument and how inside it it's got its own little event 
that kind of progresses through these sections and intensifies the music the closer the player gets. Well, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to hook up this distance to goal parameter um, to uh, the the player basically and how far or how close the player is to this key here. So I hope you're looking forward to that and I hope this helped you. If you're following along with the course, uh, uh, well, whatever you want to call this series, if you're following along, I hope this is easy for you to set up. Uh, if not, I hope this gives you some inspiration if you are setting up music for your own game or your own little project. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, issues or recommendations that you'd like to see from this channel, anything audio related, anything video game re related, um, yeah, just send me a comment. I'll be happy to check it out. Uh, as always, I've been Henry Scott, and thank you very much for watching.